Well, after that, I feel I should ask our panel to get up and do a dance, each of them. But I, <laughs> Admiral Sh no, you don't want no, to you don't want to start. You okay. Want <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, we are going to pick up on what we heard from Admiral Davidson. Um, and as he mentioned, APEC is currently going on. Uh, half a world away, and as we were sleeping here, leaders were talking, and we heard two very different visions of the world. We heard President Xi give a speech in which he said, amongst other things, global growth is shadowed by protectionism and unilateralism. History has shown that confrontation, whether in the form of a cold war, hot war, or trade war, will produce no winners. We also heard from Vice President Mike Pence, who said, we don't drown our partners in a sea of debt. We don't coerce or compromise your independence. We do not offer a constricting belt or a one-way road. America offering an alternative to China's belt and road initiative. Well, we're gonna discuss those competing visions, what they mean for us, for the region, for the countries in the region, uh, I'm pleased to say we're joined by members of what our colleagues here at Halifax have dubbed the Quad Squad, the uh, Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, one of the forums for discussing security issues in the region, four countries represented here. Um, first of all, uh, Ken Sasse, Ambassador Ken Sasse, who's currently President and Director General of the Japan Institute of International Affairs. He was for six years until quite recently a Japanese ambassador to Washington. Next to him, Admiral Carl Schultz, who's a commandant of the US Coast Guard. Further along, Andrew Shearer, who is Deputy Director General of the Office of National Assessments of Australia. Uh, for the uninitiated, it means he's a very senior figure in Australian intelligence. And uh, Far end, Dr. Manoj Joshi, who is a distinguished fellow and of the Observer Research Foundation and an expert on national security. So welcome all of you. Uh, at this point, I'll just say if you are attempting to get the attention of, of any world leaders who use Twitter, you might want to uh, tweet uh, at HFX Forum. Uh, that's our uh, Twitter handle here. And the hashtag is HISF2018. So without further ado, I think we do need to start with first principles. I think most of us will agree that's a good place to start. We heard from Admiral Davidson that the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific region is, is a vision that was enunciated by, by President Trump, by Secretary of State Pompeo, uh, initially, I think, by Prime Minister Abe. I think he was the first uh, leader to, to talk in those terms, but I wonder what you all think that means. What is a free and open Indo-Pacific? What does that represent for, for your countries, or what do your countries think it represents? Let's start with you, Ambassador. Well, thank you very much. Uh, before, in you know, talking about this, I just want to say a few words of thanks to uh, Mrs. McCain. Throughout my service in Washington, Senator McCain was uh, always a good supporter to Alliance. I very much appreciate what he did to support the Alliance throughout the years. Uh, but coming back to uh, these value things, uh, listening to uh, what uh, Admiral you know, Davidson said, uh, the history, you know, uh, 200 years history, he said, America had maintained this value free and open. I, I, I was a bit amused because in Japanese terms, it comes uh, basically after the World War II. We harbor the freedom, democracy. We had some bad histories with the United States and so forth. But throughout all these years, I think our foundation was always alliance with the United States. That came very strong and prospered based upon the value. But this value thing in the Pacific, you know, free and open value, it's not necessarily counter-punching to Chinese way because we don't have to do it. We need to confirm, stand on our own values, freedom, democracy, and, and all the human rights rule of law that has been there throughout the years. So what we need to do is to invite China to be a part of this process rather than to 
to saying that uh, we don't like uh, you know, Chinese BLI, for example, because they have their own problem. And they try to introduce their own Chinese way of democracy, as, as, as this video was, was saying. And even introducing Chinese way of doing business and, and giving loans, and about loans, actually, and debt trap policy. So uh, we don't need to be really antagonizing China in that way. We could simply advise China to come on board. This is the way you should do the business. Admiral Sh uh, Schwartz, we, we, we've, uh, Schultz, we, we've got there the, the Japanese vision that I think was enunciated by Prime Minister Abe. He said when he met President Xi recently, we've moved from competition to coexistence. Mm. But it's very clear from America's defense security vision now that there is competition, that America sees China, together with Russia, as its competitor. So how would you see the vision? Well, I think the uh, Secretary of Defense coins it pretty eloquently. He says we'll compete and you know, cooperate where we can and compete vigorously where we must. And I think that's, that's uh, you know, for the Coast Guard in the Arctic, it's become an increasingly competitive space in, this, in the uh, Indo-PACOM area, as we support the combatant commander, Admiral Davis, and his team at Indo-PACOM, you know, we support a free and open Indo-PACOM region. And when, when you see activities, though, you know, so I'll, I'll use, for example, a sister service to the Chinese Coast Guard now move from civilian control to the People's Armed Police um, under the Central Military Commission of China, you know, the aggressive arm of the China Sea Services, you add to that the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia, you know, what used to be traditional fishing grounds for the Philippines is, is under attack now. So how, does that, how does that change your approach? Well, I think for us, as a sort of supporting fires capability, we've been a Pacific Coast Guard for 169 years. We followed the Gulf, Russia, California, sailed around South America, out to the Hawaiian Islands. We've had enduring missions. I think the backdrop of this competitive environment has put a little more geopolitical focus on what we do. We, we work in the Oceania countries. Um, we've got agreements out there. Small countries, large exclusive economic zones, very little ca capability to patrol those. So we're all about building partner capacity, particularly their maritime security, law enforcement capabilities, and then creating cooperative regional engagements that support what we call that free and open environment, the international based rules. Does it fe feel like a less secure region at the moment? I think there's been examples of it being an increasingly you know, at times aggressive areas, some, uh, you know, coercion below that threshold of, of conflict, uh, that little, you know, the gray zone term applies to some of the behaviors we've seen out there. Naval vessels coming within 45 yards of American ships? Yeah, things, things like the code of conduct that Admiral Davison talked about. Those are important. We've been having those discussions though for decades here. You know, um, the code for unplanned encounters at sea, that needs to be expanded to not just military naval vessels really to include law enforcement vessels because I, I talked about sort of how the Chinese Coast Guard has repositioned itself as now a arm of the military. We got to rethink that a little bit. It may have been going on for decades but that was before the Great Wall of Sam's that exactly. the Admiral talked about. I scribbled that one down. <laughs> um, let's turn to the Australian point of view Andrew. What we heard from the Japanese ambassador, former ambassador here was the, the the, the idea, of course, that Japan and Australia are in this position where they are already invested in the Belt and Road Initiative. There are memorandums of understanding that have been signed by states in Australia, for example. It is this tension between having strong economic ties with China, but at the same time having close military and a diplomatic alliance with the United States. Is that a tension that can be managed? Before I answer that, I'd just like to add my appreciation for Senator McCain's contribution. Um, Senator McCain was a tireless champion for our alliance and, as we would say, a good mate, and we miss him. Um, when Australia thinks about the Indo-Pacific, of course, our position is unique. Uh, it's a very natural construct for us the Pacific Ocean laps our eastern shore and uh, the Indian Ocean laps our western shore. Um, and it makes sense to us to think about this strategic system in that way. 
But there is no getting away from the fact that the free and open part of that construct is under increasing challenge. And we see that in all the domains that Admiral Davidson laid out, I think, very eloquently for us. Um, Australia has China as our largest trading partner. That's a relationship we ob obviously value. And of course, we have a very long standing alliance with the United States. We've been a huge beneficiary of the freedom and openness of this region for a long time. Uh, we're deeply invested in that and we want to see it continue. So working with Japan, working with India, uh, working with Southeast Asian countries who share the broad set of values and that broad investment in the type of region that we have enjoyed thus far is going to be critically important to shape the future of the region. So what does it mean for Australia, this, this phrase of free and open Indo-Pacific? It means the ability uh, to trade and invest freely across the region. Uh, it means countries in the region having the sovereign right to make their own choices about how they, how they organise their economies, to make their own security choices to make their own choices about how they organise their politics and their societies. That's fundamental. It means the right to navigate and overfly uh, all parts of the region where international law says we have those rights. Let's turn to you, um, Manoj Joshi. Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific. Does the term Indo-Pacific bring India on board in a way that wasn't in the past? Well, you know, uh, as a scholar, I've seen uh, till a point in time, Asia Pacific used to end in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, when it ended in Southeast Asia, uh, China loomed very large. What's happened now is you've stretched it to include the Indian Ocean. And China looms slightly smaller because there's another big country there. And that's India. And I think the United States has recognized this uh, by changing the name of its Pacific Command to the Indo-Pacific Command. But it's still, a lot of this is work in progress. In the sense, your geography def defines your politics. I think Mr. Scherer has just pointed out uh, how Australia looks, you know, one shore Pacific, one shore Indian Ocean. As far as India is concerned, India is both a continental nation as well as an Indian Ocean nation. We have large commitments to our continental security, large commitments to Indian Ocean security. And into this, this new concept has come. And we are working with like-minded countries uh, to give it a certain shape. As you can see, it's been very recent, meaning uh, we know that Prime Minister Abe had raised it uh, several years earlier. And actually, the origin of the term comes with an Indian naval captain uh, back in 2007. And uh, he was the first to utilize this uh, term. And uh, many of my academic colleagues have been utilizing this thing. But when you use the word free and open, you're obviously investing certain political meaning to it. There's a geographic definition. And our prime minister, uh, uh, speaking at the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, was quite clear. He went in for the geographic definition because he says we don't see uh, the Indo-Pacific any, in any terms of any kind of strategy. So the free and open part of it, our parts uh, are definitely politics. I'm not saying that the politics are not benign or worthwhile. They're definitely worthwhile. They're important. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done uh, around uh, the Indo-Pacific. And we can see this, for example, the third meeting of the Quad. Uh, four countries had four press releases. So we're still working at it. And we're also trying to work out who came up with the term first. Is there an Australian claim on <laughs> Oh, I, I think Minister Bishop would, uh, would uh, like to have a, a bit of the, uh, the credit. <laughs> um, we heard in, in the, the remarks from President Xi, he is focusing on the current trade disagreement between the United States and China. Can you separate that from the security aspect of it? 
Well, uh, my view is that you cannot at the end. Uh, for the time being, I think uh, we basically support what the United States try to do vis-a-vis -vis China, because what China is doing is basically not really in line with uh, market principle. And all this industrial policy and uh, intellectual property issues and high tariffs and so forth, they cannot claim that they are developing countries anymore. They need to get, a, get rid of a special and differentiated treatment. They need to come into Paris Club. They need to follow OECD guidelines because they are already big economy. So uh, for that reason, I think there is a, a good chunk of, of the effort China need to do to be a part of this uh, you know, regional uh, uh, rules-based uh, order in terms of uh, free and open uh, trade. Is there any evidence that they are listening to those I arguments? I think they are listening even in, inside China. I think there is a debate now because I think uh, uh, they, they were talking about uh, uh, the uh, free, defender of uh, free trade. Uh, people, but most of the people don't uh, agree with that one anymore because China is doing obviously Chinese way. But if this becomes a norm, so a global norm, what could it do? So I think there is a pretty much opposition to this uh, Chinese model exported uh, to the region and beyond the region. So I think that is a common recognition. So uh, I hope that uh, there will be some discussion, construct discussion taking place between Beijing and Washington uh, to address this question. But uh, longer term, I don't think that China would abandon the uh, idea like China 2025 because that is, uh, you know, related to their technological, you know, advancement of the thought. And that is related to military technology eventually. So this is very much a long time a strategic shot. So for that, there is a rivalry and competition throughout the years. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I do. I would echo, my, you know, Japanese Coast Guard's one of our strongest partners in the region, fantastic partners. And I think from a Coast Guard perspective, a U.S. military perspective, I think it's two sides of the same coin. I think economic prosperity and security are absolutely linked. And when you look at the second largest economy as the largest, you know, still developing status without taking a role and a leadership role in the region, I think that's problematic. So I, I would echo the ambassador's words, absolutely so. And this idea of China coercing countries through the large-scale investments, the large-scale uh, initiatives, what, what, what does America have to counter that? I think we have our history. I think, the, I think we're seeing some, some turnings. You look at Sri Lanka, you look at different countries that are seeing some different experiences now where you know, it, it looked like a partnership until, until you defaulted on loans. Now it looks like ownership of, uh, of your infrastructure, potentially of your ports. I think, I think there's an unfolding, more clear story that's, that's playing out here on the, on the world stage. So is that, so America's relying on countries, um, Sri Lanka you mentioned, Malaysia, Maldives, becoming disillusioned yeah, I think with the, one, the, the Belt and Road Initiative? I think a little bit of that. I think you, right now with APEC, uh, we've, I've got a team of 100 Coast Guard men and women over there asked through the State Department by Papua New Guinea. You know, we, I think Admiral Davidson or maybe it was General Dunford talked about helping build out a base there with the Papua New Guineans. You know, the Chinese are keenly interested in being involved there and building infrastructure. And I think we're coming in with a choice, maybe a little more aggressively than we have in previous years to say, hey, we want to be your partner in the region and, uh, and that's we've got to up our game there a little bit. I think that's some of that's going on. So it's, it's being aware of sort of what's unfolding around you. It was interesting yesterday listening to the, one of the panels, the gentleman from Nigeria, and his perspective though about mm -hmm. the Western loans and, uh, and what they see as China as a choice. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of unfolding around us here. Well, he, he was very much saying, yeah, yeah. bottom line is money talks, doesn't it? And I think that's what I heard. We chatted a little <laughs> bit in the margins, but it's, I guess where you sit's where you stand as you look at that, as you look at that problem set. Do, do you think, and Andrew Shearer, that then there needs to be a definition of what free and open Indo-Pacific means? Does there need to be some kind of document, something that, that binds countries, like-minded countries together? I think we all need to uh, do some work to flesh out the concept. I think... Um, there are some anxieties in Southeast Asia, for example, about it, not, not 
everywhere in Southeast Asia. Indonesia and Thailand are developing their own Indo-Pacific strategies, and I think that's very positive. I don't think we should try and straightjacket everyone into one uh, very um, structured uh, definition, but I do think that we have more work to do to reassure Southeast Asia, for example, that we see ASEAN as, as central uh, in the region, that this isn't about bypassing ASEAN, it's not about, um, it's not about splitting the Indo-Pacific, it's about bringing it together in an open, inclusive way. So I do think we've got work to do, uh, but I don't think we need to be overly prescriptive either. But is, is there a danger in, <coughs> by their nature, democracies which are free and open and have different perspectives, find it hard to compete against a country like China which knows what it wants, is happy to rip up the rule books, is happy to build military installations despite promising not to? I think what I see is a group of countries in the region whose interests are converging and who do largely share a view about what sort of region we want to preserve and what sort of values we want that region to stand for. And I think uh, we should be uh, more confident than perhaps we have been in recent years about what our offering is and uh, making that choice available to countries in the region in, in clearer terms. I think the US administration has, has started to do that um, I think obviously that's part of a broader, more intense strategic uh, competition with, with China. But I still think that we have a very attractive proposition actually for the long term and that if we can somehow uh, regroup domestically, um, uh, recover some of our self-confidence and, um, and promote those values more effectively in the region, uh, we can be successful. From the Indian point of view, is, is all of this a, an opportunity to a certain well, extent? You know that uh, India was the first country to raise uh, the warning flag on BRI. When the Belt and Road Initiative Forum took place in Beijing last year, we publicly, our Ministry of External Affairs publicly issued a press release uh, criticizing it. Uh, at that time, many countries did not, many countries who are now uh, critical of the BRI, uh, some of them attended, some sent observers to the BRI uh, forum. So I wouldn't say uh, in that sense opportunity, but I think India is very much involved with countries, like-minded countries, uh, in seeing what uh, Andrew said about the question, what can be posed as an alternative? Now, India being a, a very poor country obviously doesn't have the resources with which you can invest in infrastructure in third countries because we have a huge investment task in our own country. But we are in partnership with countries like Japan. Uh, we have planned, uh, we, are, we, are, we work on something called the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, uh, which we are planning linkages, uh, connectivity linkages between Southeast Asia, India, and uh, Africa. The United States, see, all this is something very, very recent. It's a year old, meaning when Mr. Tillerson for the first time said that we are discussing mechanisms uh, you know, uh, to raise money. So now the US has come up with the BUILD Act with $60 billion. Uh, they've also unleashed OPIC. Now for a long time, OPIC was kind of a bad word for the Republican ideologues. And now OPIC has gone, because you know the United States and the West over, historically over time, they have vast resources in their private sector. Private sector is hugely cash rich, but the private sector is gonna invest. Um, as far as risky investments are concerned, they require some amount of protection. And institutions like OPIC, we had almost forgotten that there was an institution like that. So I think that, uh, as I said, that we are working together, we are getting our act together. With Japan, we are a little further down the road because we, uh, Japan has uh, made uh, major commitments to development in India's northeast. Plus, Japan is extremely active in Southeast Asia in infrastructure construction. And there is a natural kind of a linkage between India and Japan there. We are right now bidding in projects in uh, Sri Lanka. So what has happened is that in, the, in this just last one year, uh, I think people have 
suddenly uh, realize that this is an issue, we need to confront it, and I think we are doing pretty well uh, for all that. We're doing pretty well. I'm saying the US has got the Build Act, I think maybe six months flat after they decided that we, we need to move uh, uh, on this. So I'm, I'm quite um, uh, confident. So if you're looking, if you're to answer your question directly, if there's an opportunity, there is yes an opportunity when we work together with our partners. Um, obviously there will be opportunities, Indian expertise, Indian diaspora in Eastern Africa, uh, Indian diaspora in the Persian Gulf region, um, the Indian um, uh, you know, skilled workers, as well as managerial uh, uh, and IT professionals. We can certainly contribute with that. Admiral Schultz, Admiral Davidson said that the, the clarity of vision uh, is new. Um, is what we are talking about continuity in American policy, or is it change to reflect a, a changing reality? It's probably both. I think we heard the history through Admiral Davison's, you know, very interesting walk there. I think. It recently reported in open press, we just had two carrier strike groups over there showing, I think, a new refound commitment. We've transferred seven um, excess defense article, 300 high, 378 foot high endurance cutters to the region, three to the Philippine Navy, um, one to the Vietnamese, two to Bangladesh, one to Sri Lanka that hasn't left Hawaii yet. But I think there's a, a commitment of, of capacity. We will transfer those ships. We'll help train those people to operate those ships. I think there's a new refound commitment which I would say it's probably more the latter than it's just kind of a doubling down of, of the importance, the urgency, and signaling to our ASEAN partners. You know, you look at the, what is it, four of the 10 ASEAN partners, you know, have compl conflicting claims, maritime claims down there. And uh, I think free and open Indo-Pacific is not just for the large countries, it's for all the countries. And, and that's where I think we're, you know, we're dispensing a little bit of Coast Guard reach under the you know, under the umbrella of the geographic combatant commander to touch places where there hasn't been a lot of offsetting U.S. influence. China's been dispensing liaisons in places. You know, where can we come in and complement the Department of Defense efforts here to show a, a re-wickering, a re-strengthening of that, that partnership? And just on the, the question of dealings with the Chinese and this idea of the rules of the road and mechanisms to, if there are incidents, to, to talk through what should happen. Are those mechanisms still in place? Are you able to, to keep a dialogue going with the Chinese? Well, I think we're all about the peaceful you know, resolution of, of interactions. Um, I don't have a lot of the specifics on the recent Navy interaction at you know, reportedly 45 yards. That's concerning as a, as a Coast Guard ship driver for much of my career. That puts, you know, puts sailors in jeopardy and lives in jeopardy. That's not a good situation. It, 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 Re-emphasize, I think, the importance of of a code of conduct, but that gets trapped up. And I think Admiral Davidson articulated sort of what the expectations were from a China perspective about that code of conduct, that veto power. We so clearly can't support that. So, I think it'll remain tense in the area. You hope seeing our allies operate and stepping up on some of the freedom of navigation type operations. I think that strengthens the the global resolve to signal that that type of behavior is not accepted on the international stage. Can we talk about, about trade and how it fits in? Obviously, J Japan has is taking the lead now on regional trade, if you like, on mm -hmm. TPP or the, the, uh, the, the sort of rump TPP, I suppose you might say, but without America. Um, how does America's withdrawal from, from that particular agreement and perhaps more broadly the, the America First ethos that underpins the defense and security strategy undercut its ability to keep strong alliances? Well, for that, I, uh, I, I think that the, all this, uh, the collaborations on the uh, security side is not really much affected by all this, uh, uh, I would say if there is any on the approach to the trade. Even on the approach to trade, uh, we understand the uh, political reality of these countries. So we have to live with that in a way. Uh, but on, on the other hand, you know, uh, depending on how all these uh, you know, talks with, with Chinese would come out, there is always some merit 
we could cherish together if China would continue to respond in a positive way and change it. And uh, you know, if we, we try to get China into uh, TPP, it's not easy, I mean, to get China on board, whether it is intellectual property, commerce, well, uh, you know, the rules on service and investment all the way. But when you go directly by that frame, and I think uh, that might uh, be able to produce something. And at the end, that could be multinationalized. That'd be great. But uh, at the same time, we continue to commit the regional free trade. So uh, we so just, do, uh, just... Just to we, pick up on what you said, do you, you foresee a TPP without America but with China? Uh, well, we prefer America to be an integral part of TPP, of course. I mean, we are not re really abandoning that, that ambition. But at the same time, we know the political reality, the policy of this uh, you know, uh, Trump administration. There is no use to preach at this moment. But we know that at the end, the uh, United States come to this point. What is the best in terms of regional free trade and pivoting or rebalancing all this uh, trade unfairness evolving around China? Okay, I think at, at this point, uh, since we have four esteemed uh, panelists here. I'm sure many of you have questions for them, so uh, I'll open it up to the floor. Um, first hand I saw was over there, but we'll have time for plenty of others. Yes, this gentleman here. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hideshi Tokuchi. I'm senior fellow of the uh, Japan's National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. I'd like to thank all, four, all the four panelists for the great presentation. and. Um, I, I'd like to uh, ask one question to Admiral Schultz and also to uh, Mr. Andrew Sierra. Uh, my question is about the gray zone warfare which China engineers it, uh, at the East Asian Sea, South China Sea and East China Sea. And uh, the China uses um, coast, not necessarily its own uh, navy, but uh, rather a coast guard and uh, the fishermen under the disguise, I mean, sorry, uh, maritime militia under the disguise of fishermen. And they are connected to the central government through the uh, Chinese version of GPS, which has a you know, mating function. So um, it's very similar to uh, the uh, Russian uh, hybrid warfare, uh, which uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are you know, uh, engaging in the uh, European side. Therefore, uh, the uh, NATO, uh, countries and the U.S. Asian allies can cooperate with each other to devise a common tactics to, uh, uh, you know, address those uh, type of warfare. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, your views about that. And also, you know, uh, Admiral Schultz, uh, you uh, mentioned uh, the expanding the application of naval cues to Coast Guard. I think it's a very good idea, but uh, you know, as far as I know, Southeast Asian countries, their coast guards are not necessarily willing to expand the application of cues to their own coast guards. So how can we persuade them to uh, that idea? I would like to ask uh, your view. So your first question in terms of, let me speak specifically to the uh, People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia. That is very concerning. And you know, those are vessels up to upwards of a couple hundred feet in length, 60, 70, 80 meters in length. Um, clearly, they link back to central government. They have water cannons on them. I think the government built a fleet of 84 plus or minus boats down in Hainan province. So that is very troubling. And, and that is the actioning arm, the Coast Guard under the People's Armed Police, now a you know, direct link, as I said earlier, to Central Military Commission. That's a different model. And that, that is, it is concerning. I think that is why, as I, I said to Jamie earlier, we sort of from an international community standpoint have to look at that and reject that as acceptable behavior. When we talk about international rule-based order, using your fishermen under the premise as an extension of government and claiming it's something other than I think is very disingenuous. You know, on the cues, I think it, it's sort of in the same discussion space. Um, if it was just naval ships, and they, the Chinese weren't using the Chinese Coast Guard, China Coast Guard, as, as that aggressive arm down there in that, in that gray zone type operations you talked about, we wouldn't be talking about broadening that. You know? So I think, I think it's, a, it's relevant conversation right now. I think 
as what we call law enforcement vessels. As I understand the Chinese Coast Guard, they do coastal defense, they do maritime law enforcement, they do search and rescue. Very, very analogous to the United States Coast Guard. Their vessels have stripe on board like our Coast Guard. They're much bigger than our Coast Guard. I think what the United States Coast Guard brings, not as the world's biggest Coast Guard, but maybe a model for world Coast Guards, is we're all about maritime governance and, and we reinforce the values that we'd like to see in a free and open Indo-PACOM region. Uh, over there, lady. Hi, Alyssa Ayers from the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, we've seen the framework of the Quad shift a little bit from what had once been a purely military-focused security dialogue to something that now has a broader set of issues that it's covering. The most recent Quad meeting was not called a quadrilateral security dialogue. It was called a consultation among these four different countries. And the order of the countries listed on all of the different statements released depends on which country is releasing it, of course. Um, but of course, the power of the Quad in the Indo-Pacific is the fact that all four countries are democracies. So if I could ask all of you or whoever would like to speak about this, what more can the Quad countries be doing together to help shore up democracy in this larger Indo-Pacific region? Yeah. Who'd like to answer? Okay, I, I think you, you uh, asked a very right question. I think this concept of Quad is evolving over some time. It started uh, uh, trilateral, obviously, Japan, U.S., Australia, or Japan, U.S., India, Japan, Australia, India, whatever. But uh, uh, somehow there was hesitation on the part of India and India sometime because that's too much offensive to China at the time. But nowadays, I think it, India seems to be moving step by step in a way to, uh, to understand what is the uh, a strategic threat uh, coming, strategic competition, I would say, uh, coming from, from China. So there is a good reason for a country like India to be more deeply involved and associated with the United States, Australia, and Japan. And that's not simply limited to uh, uh, security collaboration. That goes beyond that, as you just said it. And that involves what are the right uh, uh, weapons or right uh, instruments uh, to, to meet the demand of infrastructure in the region. I think there is a big demand. I think it's not for the country growing rapidly. Uh, you know, they, are, uh, they need uh, funds, whether it is Chinese, US, or Japanese, or whatever. And so there is a good reason that uh, some of the countries, uh, weaker developing country, why to have a Chinese uh, uh, non-financial corporate launch, I mean, they are easy way to do, but at the end of the day, they might be trapped into larger country debt, and that is a threat. So we need to, uh, to get rid of those dangers ahead, and, and some of the uh, risky countries around the world, the seven or eight, I mean, IMF is uh, talking about it. Uh, this could be a major uh, source of uh, uh, global, global instability in terms of debt crisis to be triggered. Andrew, what about the Australian point of view? Our previous Labour government actually pulled out of the Quad for a while, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I think the, quad, the Quad's time has come, though, and I think it's now a more stable entity. I think the challenge is to be a bit more precise about what it is and what it isn't. I think we, we didn't get that messaging quite right at the start, and so... Um, reassuring the region that the Quad is just one of a number of useful mechanisms to contribute to this greater objective of a free and open Indo-Pacific, I think is important. My own view is that the Quad should um, pursue um, sort of pragmatic, uh, functional areas of cooperation. The Ambassador mentioned some. Others might include counter-proliferation, counter-terrorism, um, I think there's, a, there's an agenda around building closer interoperability uh, among the four countries so they can respond to humanitarian disasters. So I think we should be thinking in that way about uh, how we can um, uh, accumulate greater capability and greater capacity in the Quad to help with a whole range of problems rather than worrying too much about high-level goals, what the membership criteria are, all that kind of stuff. Uh, where you just get wrapped up around the axles. It's actually born out of a humanitarian the, response, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami. Mm. Okay, thanks. Can I make Good a point course, on please. that? Uh, mm. You know, uh, I think Ambassador made a reference to India. Uh, you see, 
India's perspective with the Quad has to do with where India is located. For countries like Japan, Australia, obviously the Pacific Ocean is an extremely important, or what's happening in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia is very important. Where we are looked, our principal center of gravity from our, sec our security concerns is in the Northern Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf. 60% of our oil comes from there. 8 million of our citizens work there. They send back $40 billion annually back home. There is no comparable area in the East to that. So that's our principal area of focus. And as I said, this is a work in progress. The Indo-Pacific concept of the United States as of now ends at Diego Garcia. Meaning there's nothing to the West. We have no conversation with, with the um, Central Command. We have no conversation with the Africa Command. So there are gaps. Now, there, I've heard that the United States might change the operating area of the Indo-Pacific Command all the way to the shores of East Africa. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that when we have to make commitments, we have to first see our principal area of, of um, uh, you know, where we have to put in our effort, our security effort. But India is a country whose capabilities are growing. Along with its economy, the capabilities are growing. Over time, I'm sure we will catch up uh, in that area. But right now, we need, uh, and the other point I had made, that we are a continental country. We have a 4,000 kilometer border with China. We have a, I think, 2,700 kilometer border with Pakistan. And these two countries uh, are call each other their best, best of friends. So we need this perspective before we can really make commitments, security commitments, security related commitments uh, in areas which are somewhat little more distant. But as I said, over time, everything is very new. We are, work, we are working towards it, and I th I'm sure we'll get there. So I said the first principles was what is the definition of a free and open Indo-Pacific. You're saying actually the first principle is what is Indo-Pacific? Well, <laughs> as I said, if you're going to create some concept called the Indo-Pacific, then it cannot be a unilateral definition. I Meaning you can't say that, as far as I'm concerned, the Indo-Pacific ends at Diego Garcia. It doesn't, because if it's Indo, it must take in all of the Indian Ocean. And where we have, uh, you can't say that we'll exclude the areas where you, where you have interests, but you must be part of the area where we have interests. So, you know, there's a balance of interests uh, out there. Uh, Admiral Schultz, I wonder whether America would think of extending that definition of Indo-Pacific to take in the Persian Gulf. And that takes in one very important well, I would uh, tell you, as, as a member of the Fifth Armed Question. Service, not in the Department of Defense, I'm probably going to stay out of that I thought you might do. I thought you <laughs> might. I don't think that's my, <laughs> my sea lane of communication. No, I, I, yeah. I, I must say uh, that we have, we have now uh, uh, posted a liaison officer to the Fifth Fleet uh, headquarters. So that's the beginning. But I think the Americans are now understanding that this is, this, uh, this is an issue uh, that if there are four members of the Quad Obviously, where they are geographically located, that gives them their security perspective. And those must be also um, uh, aligned before we take further steps. OK, some more questions. Let me have a look around. The hand at the back, waving. Thank you very much. I'm Véronique roger lacan the French ambassador to the OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And as such, I'm obsessed by Russia by its content violations of its commitments. I would be interested in the views of the panel on the Abe-Putin discussions for the timing. Thank you. OK, uh, I think the, there had been a lot of uh, meeting going on uh, between the President uh, Putin and Prime Minister Abe. You know that there is a big uh, agenda uh, we have been addressing over 70 years uh, after the end of the war. This is a peace treaty. And uh, our position is that uh, without uh, getting resolved of long-standing trade, sorry, uh, territorial dispute around the Northern Territory, it's really hard. And so I think they have been now uh, trying to work on the way forward. And uh, Russian position is that, uh, you know, they can't really uh, uh, you know, recognize all these four islands back to Japan. And uh, our position is that we need to get those four islands back to Japan. These before. are the Northern Territories, Northern, the Russian calls yeah, and the Kuril right, Islands. Right, right. And uh, this had, there had been dispute for ma many years. 
unless there is a settlement on this issue, there is no real uh, peace coming back between, uh, between Japan and the United States. So uh, they have been discussing for some years and they continue to discuss. And I hope that uh, there will be some progress on the front. It doesn't mean that uh, we would be on the same board with uh, European and American friends and allies when it comes to some critical issues like uh, Ukraine issues, for example. And uh, we are together uh, going for the sanctions uh, uh, with our friends and allies. So we, we distinguish what we need to do uh, to conclude uh, the long-standing you know, problem with Russia and uh, while addressing the current issues of security agenda with, 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 with Russia. Okay. Let's get plenty more hands up over there. Uh, Richard Hidarian from the Philippines. Um, given the hybrid nature of the disputes uh, and the context, contest for power in the South China Sea, uh, Admiral Schultz, do you see, do you foresee a possible role for the U.S. Coast Guard? I mean, one development right now is that even the Chinese Coast Guard is put under the command of the PLA Navy, and yet they're using the cover of the Coast Guard to actually push the envelope of China's claim all the way to the North Natuna Sea. Don't you think that maybe it's time also for the U, uh, U.S. Coast Guard to be more involved since the U.S. has defense alliances and already a strong presence in the area? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the question. First off, I would say we are involved. You know, the, uh, the Philippine Coast Guard is growing from 5,000 to 35,000 here in, in between now and I think 2022. And we are partnered up on training on helping them understand what that evolves to be a bigger Coast Guard, what the requirements are, the expectations. So we're working there. We're working with the Vietnamese on their maritime forces. Uh, we respond to you know, what we call inside the Pentagon and Coast Guard parlance, request for forces, and uh, there's discussions about what are those Coast Guard you know, capabilities that might enhance security in the region a little bit. So it, there's an ongoing dialogue supporting the Indo-PACOM commander, but we're, we're currently there. We're partnering and training with the Malaysians. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the transfer of multiple large ships. Uh, we do excess defense article type type thing like those ships. There's foreign military sales, a lot of small boats based on Coast Guard, small boat operations, so we're working on, on building capacity there. We are keenly focused on those like-minded partners, maritime capabilities, security, law enforcement, and then building that, that regional approach to the type of behaviors we think belong on the international rule-based order stage here. That, that's where we're at. And what does that mean in terms of future Coast Guard commitments? There's ongoing discussions, ongoing planning efforts. Thank you. Uh, Um, Atate Kamiya, uh, Professor of International Relations at National Defense Academy of Japan. I would like to clarify uh, Japan's position, Japan's attitude toward China uh, in regard to a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy uh, based upon my own observation because uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, recent policy toward China has made some kind of uh, uh, worry, wor wor worrying uh, concern among the uh, other democracies in the world. Uh, obviously, Abe wants to improve uh, Japan's relationship with uh, China because uh, Japan is geographically very close to China and Japan cannot afford uh, bad relations with China. So uh, in Beijing recently, uh, Abe, as a moderator introduced, and Abe uh, and Xi Jinping agreed that uh, the relationship between the two countries should move from uh, competition to uh, uh, coexistence. But that doesn't mean that Abe abandons, Abe, Abe is go going to abandon his determination to protect uh, rules-based order in the free and open Indo-Pacific. Actually, Abe is the first a uh, state official who advocated the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. He did that in uh, August 2016, one year earlier than uh, President Trump. And uh, he has been very consistent in, consistent in uh, his determination to protect uh, uh, liberal rules-based order in the Asia-Pacific and globally since he returned to power in the, at the end of uh, year 2012. And, uh, uh, he has been consistent uh, to, to, to advocate the expansion of a traditional Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific also. Uh, and, and you should not, uh, anybody should not uh, misunderstand that his endeavor to improve Japan's relationship with uh, uh, China means, any, uh, means uh, you know, his, uh, how do you say, 
weakening position, uh, he, he weaks up, he, he weaks his position uh, to counter China's challenge to rules-based international order in the Indo-Pacific. Thank, thank thanks, you. thanks very much for that observation. We haven't got much time, so let's just try and take a couple more questions. That's the first hand I saw go up. Uh, thank you. I'm diplomat, and diplomats tend to generalize issues. So I'm ambassador of Estonia to Canada for three months. Uh, but I have a kind of general question. Coming back to Belt and Road Initiative, um, it has 60 um, countries uh, involved from Chinese perspective. And my question is how you should see it uh, as uh, academicians. Uh, is it a kind of global peace offer for t in trade? Or is it just calculation of geopolitics? I'm afraid and suspected, in fact, that in both hands, on, from both sides, there are challenges. Mm -hmm. So what is it? A trade peace right. agreement or? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Very quick, who wants to answer? Yeah, yeah, I think that involves both, obviously. And this is uh, both uh, trade, geoeconomics, eventually uh, strategic uh, uh, objective behind it. So I think. Uh, we are not this uh, very much, a dis we shouldn't be disillusioned what uh, all this motivation behind it. But at the same time, as the, uh, uh, my uh, colleagues in Japan said it, you know, uh, we are not really going to antagonize China when it comes to infrastructure building, economic support. As far as what they do is accountable, transparent, financially sound, they are okay. I mean, uh, you know, depending on the project they are involved. Not every project is like the one in Sri Lanka, say, I would say. So we have to be selective in a way, as we do to AIIB, for example. AIIB, when it got started, people were very suspicious when the Europeans came. And what they are doing today is not necessarily totally off the rock. So I think the way you do is, is important. Unfortunately, we have, we have run out of time. Thank you all so much for your questions. I'm sure you'll want to, to talk individually to the panel members afterwards. Um, sorry for those we didn't get uh, round to, to uh, asking. Uh, thank you all for your cooperation, for your uh, interesting questions. But thanks most of all to all our panelists. So uh, Admiral Schultz, uh, Manoj Joshi, uh, Ambassador Sasse, and uh, Andrew Shearer, thank you all very much for taking part. Thank you. Thank you.